Hey guys, Speculative Sandbox now has a shop. Treat yourself with graphic tees, tanks, stickers, and notebooks. Check out the podcast notes for a link, and don't forget to use the promo code SANDBOX to get 20% off. What do you have as your signature drink for a medieval fantasy tavern? It'd be the Green okay. Griffin, and it would be made of, uh, you know, green spirit, maybe maybe sort of like a melon liqueur mixed with some kind of uh, dragon blood, and then a little bit of a, a potion on the side. You know, you know how you can add in like an energy shot or a protein shot at the uh, smoothie stand. Well, this one you can. I can. I need a little protection puzzle. No, I would need. A protection of silence or a potion of silence. You get that added into your green griffin. Welcome to Speculative Sandbox, your audio playground for creative storytellers. My name is Vicki Lawn, and each episode, I and a guest will unpack a fiction trope with an eye for character development and narrative structures. Make sure to look for Speculative Sandbox on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter, where you can join the conversation. Leave comments or questions, or let us know what other tropes we should cover. When the real world just doesn't cut it, let's get lost in a fictional one. Welcome, weary traveler, to Ye Old Speculative Sandbox. You look like you could use a pint of our strongest beer. Enjoy a bowl of stew and crusty bread and pull up a chair to listen in on our fellow patrons as they conspire in the corner. The famous traveling bard, Brad Alice, has graced us with his presence to talk about the role of taverns in speculative fiction. Learn what makes taverns such a delightful setting, our favorite establishments, and our own original cocktails. But the biggest question is, will we make it through the night without getting pulled into an epic quest? Brad, we'll do general introductions in a second. I'm so glad to have you back on the podcast. While I don't doubt my capabilities to spin a good yarn, I do know my limitation is on knowing my alcohol. I'm hoping you could fill in that void (laughs) for this podcast. So I have some icebreaker questions I wanted to start us off with uh, to get us in the mood, uh, the right tone for this episode. So let's pretend you and I are having this conversation over wooden beer mugs while huddled in a darkened corner. There's a fire burning in the hearth. Our bartender eyes a group of rowdy travelers who have just arrived. They're covered in blood. They're wielding axes clearly i've gone for a fantasy medieval setting so brad what is the name of this tavern where are we well you may be shocked to learn this but as a young boy i played dungeons and dragons and i had a chain of taverns um they were called the green griffin okay um and what i would do is i had a table where i'd roll the dice and decide what the theme night was um, we frequently had ladies' night, but it was only lady barbarians, so invariably it would lead to my uh, poor characters getting picked on. Uh, there was, uh, there was uh, which now would be LGBTQT, but it was the gay magic users' night, and the, the characters couldn't figure out why there were only uh, male magic users in their thing. There was a uh, kobold fighting night. So I would just randomly roll it, and they would have no idea that I'd do this. They couldn't figure out why every time they went to a tavern. But yeah, it was the Green Griffin. It was sort of the Applebee's of of, uh, of Fantasyland. Ooh, Applebee's. Okay. And are we near a castle, or are we on a lonely road for weary travelers? Well, considering that we're both governmental-type employees, I would say we're at, near a castle or at least an outpost. Okay. Okay. So you can keep an eye on things while we're chatting. Oh, well, yeah. You know. Taking not our too lunch far break. from work. <laughs> and what are we drinking? What are in our, our wooden well, mugs? Alas, poor Vic has a curse that prevents her from consuming breads and alcohols. But you, you did say you had a potion of uh, protection. So I want to say, knowing your love of uh, sweets, that you're having some kind of chocolate stout, Ooh. a very thick beer. Um, and then I will say that I'm having a wheat beer and I smuggled in a little citrus from the castle stores since I'm assuming this poor tavern keeper probably doesn't have a lot of oranges, uh, on hand to, to throw into my, uh, to throw into my concoction. That sounds delicious. I approve. And our occupations, you said a little bit earlier, we are government workers. Do we work for the castle? 
I don't know if we do, probably, but I'd say we're scribes. I mean, okay. I like to think that we're also oral storytellers, so maybe we're minstrels or bards, but I would, I would say scribes. Uh, nothing nothing too flashy, you know. Uh, we, we maybe have traded in the, the sword. Back in my day, I was a, a, a journalist, and the pen was my sword, but I maybe traded that in to be a cushy scribe for, uh, for a duke or duchess. Okay. I, I'll consider myself the scribe diarist for the there prince. There you go. I'm going to follow him around, mark down everything he does. And the reason why I got this idea is because I was watching a documentary on the Windsor Castle and the Royals and Prince Charles has a diary. And I'm like, interesting, but does he write his own? So I will be the official scribe diarist for the prince. And hopefully he's not a terrible person. Although knowing our luck, we're in medieval where whatever country we're in during the medieval times. And he's probably a tyrant. That's my bet. Probably. And most importantly, do you think at some point during the night you'll get roped into a fight? Yeah, after I play hockey. <laughs> All right. So before we go into our questions, Brad, this is, I think, the third time? You've third on? one, yeah. All right. So we've had some people that, you know, listen to all the episodes, probably are familiar with you before our newcomers. Can you reintroduce yourself, please? Yeah, my name is Brad Ellis. Uh, I'm an aspiring novelist. I'm now two and a half in trying to work with an editor to uh, find an agent. I write predominantly what I would call detective crime fiction. Uh, but I am also a former cartoonist, uh, sports writer, um, general journalist. So I, I figured out that from about 1999 until I actually joined your team at a certain municipality here, I had written somewhere on the along the lines of 10 million words. Um, and that doesn't include several thousand hours of radio that I did as well. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of everything. But now um, I'm, I'm no longer, unfortunately, on your team or fortunately, depending mm -hmm. on your point of view, uh, <laughs> but still kind of in the governmental realm. Um, but, yeah, when I have time not taking care of my twins or now we have two new puppies to go along with the two existing dogs. Uh, I, I do, uh, yeah, write uh, mystery novels, basically. Growing up or in your teens or in your college years, were you a frequent tavern visitor? Yeah, yeah, obviously not in my, you know, my teens. But yeah, I, I very much enjoyed bars in college and really for three reasons. One, um, bands. It was the nineties. The alternative scene was booming. So went to go see a lot of bands, both local and national. We were, we were fortunate enough on fourth Avenue here in Tucson to get some really good bands as they broke, uh, being a huge sports fan, me and my buddies would go watch sports. We didn't have cable in the dorms back then. And I lived in the dorms for most of my time in college. And finally, as, as I kind of mentioned, I, I really, I just like talking, talking, I like telling stories. And, uh, I was fortunate to have a lot of diverse friends from all over the country so the stories were great many of which i uh stole for for, for fiction and as i moved on i mentioned i played hockey and, and my the hockey rink i play at uh has a has a bar you can cozy up to and uh so yeah don't go out nearly as much as i used to now that i am closer to 50 than i am to my 20s i'm closer to 50 than i am to 48 but uh <laughs> Yeah, do do not. Yeah, like like a bar. Not a club guy. Don't like you know dancing or any of that. But yeah, if you can see a good band or actually just even play bar trivia, I love that. Yeah, bar trivia is fantastic. I love that. So we know why we go. Well, I don't often. I should say I go to bars for social hour. And to explain what Brad was mentioning earlier, I'm allergic to alcohol, which is sad. I guess <laughs> sad and maybe a, a blessing. Probably I don't better know. for you in the long run. <laughs> I guess I've always and I'm getting that way to be honest. I can't drink as much. Like all of a sudden, tequila gives me heartburn. So margaritas are out, and oh yeah, yeah. Mold. Well, I'm I'm learning that other people are starting. What the way I would feel in my 20s is how other people are starting to feel now as we were aging. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay. So I'm just like, just I have an, an old you're soul. You're just an old soul. Yeah. I have an old soul. <laughs> So what would bring characters to a tavern in the fiction world? How are taverns used as plot devices? Um, I have a couple uh, things I could just throw out there real quick. Uh, I know them frequently for being used as a break from a long journey. I think of Lord of the Rings anytime they stop somewhere along the road. Or there needs to be some devious information exchanged. Um, I get that from the Leaky Cauldron in Harry Potter. Uh, getting information from other travelers, Game of Thrones plotting and scheming we have gaston and beauty and the beast 
and a time to get introspective. I always feel like when someone's at a bar and they're just kind of meeting people, it's a moment for them to kind of think and get inside their heads. That's in The Hobbit. And then, of course, The World's End, which is uh, a movie. It's a checkpoint or an actual destination. So what are what are your examples for why characters go to taverns? You know, yeah, I think first and foremost, all races, classes could, could be drawn to taverns. Um, you know, obviously we've seen the old trope of the princess in disguise or the princess, and they've never been. But in, in reality, alcohol is the great equalizer. Um, so you can take a, a fish out of water like, you know, like Bilbo Baggins or, or Frodo Baggins and put them there and they can meet, you know, as you, your example, you sent to be Aragon or Aragorn. Um, you can take, you know, it can be a place where naive Harry, you know, runs into the Weasley twins and, and learns some scheming. And, uh, but yeah, it, it, you know, I think the, the great example is it, it's, it can be a catalyst for adventure. Uh, whether that is the tavern, as you mentioned, Game of Thrones, and we all, I think, you know, we remember the mountain and, and Anya um, and all of that. It can also be like the Wild West. You walk into the saloon, the saloon's the tavern. Mm -hmm. And what happens? You accidentally bump into the guy playing cards or the bad guy comes in or the, they come to warn you because you're the sheriff. So it's a place where you can have a wide variety of people, uh, whether it's the hardened uh, mercenary, whether it's the damsel in distress, whether it's the... Uh, not you know the, the the fatherless child looking for help. You can put them all at the tavern because it has food, it has booze, and it you know again you can put them in the city center. You can put them at, as a waypoint in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you mentioned the World's End. Uh, there, there's a comic book called Grimjack where they had a place called Munden's Bar, and, and it was a pan-dimensional city in which all dimensions connect. So anyone can go there. Um, so yeah, it just serves as this like meeting point where a variety of people, and again, it can be the end of an adventure, the beginning of an adventure, the middle of an adventure. Uh, so it kind of serves as a, as a convenient plot device. I like to, what sets the tavern apart from like, let's say they, they meet at a library is there's that degree of alcohol. So then veils are unveiled <laughs> where people kind of let their guard down, their inhibitions are gone. And then we get to see a little bit more beneath their character. And maybe that is what kind of makes it meaningful for a tavern setting, because now we can really get into the heart of things. I know, like, leaving speculative fiction for a little bit, romance novels love to, like, introduce the bar scene to, like, kind of strip all of the guards that everyone has up and just, like, let people really show who they are. Yeah, you know, I uh, in, in my, my main character is a college-age detective, so he's obviously in bars quite a bit. Um, but I use him for a variety of things. One, there is the uh the drunken unveiling of feelings uh revealing of feelings uh whether it's it's usually by a third person going dude you don't understand this is what's going on uh, but i also use it as a meeting point um because as my character straddles uh you know in the first book it's politics in the second book it, it's uh kind of the underbelly uh you can meet the senator's right hand man at a bar you can meet uh, a professional dominatrix at a bar um so that's how yeah again how i use it and sometimes alcohol plays a point and sometimes that has absolutely nothing to do with it um yeah sometimes it's more of a food-based thing because my my character happens to be kind of a glutton for junk food but again it's a yeah you can bring in a variety can yeah just serve a variety of things a drunken brawl uh can lead to adventures if you want to reduce inhibitions it can be a confession of love it can be yeah many things I like what you said about the great equalizer, because you're right, people from all different class systems can end up in the same place. And then that's where activities could go on that you wouldn't otherwise see out in the open. So then you get that underbelly feeling, depending on the story. Well, yeah, you look at it, Star Wars with most Eisley, the cantina. Um, that's where Luke, the sheltered farm boy and, you know, Obi-Wan, the long exiled nomad, have to go find Han and Chewie. Uh, and while there, they, you know, they get in a fight with uh, the walrus man and then and the other guy. Um, you know, you look at uh, even Casablanca, uh, Rick's Cafe. It's, you know, you've got the, the gambling, you've got, the, but you've got the drinks. The Germans can be there at the same time as Ingrid Bergman. Uh, so, again, yeah, you can you can put all these people from the different spheres uh, together. Um, again, it's also a great place. You can have a, a dive bar um, where, you know, someone can have to hire a hitman or try to find, uh, you know, a, 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 a safe cracker. Uh, 
Um, you know, in, in one of my favorite series, uh, the uh, the Dresden Files, they have a place called McNally's Pub. Um, and it's a neutral location for the uh, supernatural of, of Chicago. In fact, it's designed uh, to deflect magical energy so you can have a neutral place. So again, they can serve all these different purposes. Um, and sometimes you can reuse those same settings as they do with like McNally's Pub or, um, you know, with uh, Harry Potter and the Leaky Cauldron and, and things like that. Do you think, particularly for cultures where people may be more conservative, that the appeal of a tavern is the its taboo nature? I'm sure. I'm sure that plays a part. Um, or even a certain kind of bars. Uh, you know, you talk about the dive bar. And I remember, um, uh, you know, there are a few here in Tucson that get uh, frequented. And some of us like to go there because of the cheap drinks. And some liked it because it was a, a step. You know, I remember, uh, you know, there, there were a, a, a few of uh, the people in my dorm were, were, were borderline upper crust. And you take them to a bar. There's a bar here in town called The Buffet. Um which is, you know, many a toothless person pulled up to the bar. Or um, I had a friend and she grew up, uh, when I worked in journalism, she grew up, you know, wealthy family from the East Coast. And she used to love to go to a bar that I'm not sure is there anymore called The Mint um, for, for the karaoke night. And there were a lot of sketchy characters there. But for her, it was the thrill of seeing people that her parents would never associate with. So, and yeah, if you come from... You know, very religious background. It can seem very taboo. I mean, I know people who think like again, joking. Applebee's is 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 a sinful place, or you know, TGI Fridays, because uh, you can see the alcohol behind the bar in the middle of the restaurant. Uh, and then for others who were raised, you know, my dad ran bars and restaurants for years, so uh, you know, it was nothing for me to go to a sports bar. You know, when I was ten or eleven, because my dad was working there. Interesting. I always. Do you th okay then? Do you think medi the association of taverns with medieval activities and you think about scenarios where you have people, you know, pillaging and rampaging, and then they go to a tavern, get drunk, and then there's more activity that kind of results of getting drunk. Do you think that what do you what do you think of that relationship as far as like medieval storytelling and the importance of a tavern? Again, I think it's a, it's the ability I think you have to adapt it to your character. So if you are a horde of barbarians and you've just gotten done ransacking a village and you go to the tavern, then, yeah, you have that drama of are they going to behave or are they not going to behave? Uh, are they going to carry on those activities? You know, you have the frightened uh, storekeeper and his family. Um, conversely, if you had dropped the... You know, let's say it's the prince and the princess who have never been away from the castle, but they have had to flee and they're watching the barbarians. Um, yeah. You know, so, again, it's it's that it's a great tool, especially for, um, you know, fantasy and, and medieval where you had these these great discrepancies in the haves and the haves nots. Um, you know, even today through television, we're aware of things. Uh, they were not, you know, they, the, the prince and the princess may not even know something like this existed. Uh, conversely, the barbarian hordes may not know that, you know, you, you can use a fork. Um, so again, it's a way to bring these diverse people together. It, it, interesting about the how activities happen in taverns, because I think a lot about French classic literature, there's always a crime that happens to the barkeep. Um, and I imagine if you had your own tavern, you'd probably want to have a guard or a police force or something because you're going to, you're going to be paying a lot of money for damaged property or like threats upon your own person. Yeah. And I know that, and I can't, I can't think of years ago, I read one and they, of course you had to check your sword at the door and then it was always, well, who had the knife in the boot? Um, or you had <laughs> it where the, the, the constable or the sheriff or whatever protected the bar because they liked the bar or the tavern. Um, so yeah, they might keep an off-duty person, or the, you know, that's a good idea. So get a gang of people to like have a special interest in your bar, so then they become your security. Yeah, and I know I've read detective fiction where the detective has basically his office in a corner booth, but he protects the bar. 
Um, you know, you've seen it in Westerns where the town gunfighter might hang out in the bar or may live up in you know one of the rooms that was reserved for the brothel in the bar. So, yeah, I think obviously, again, other ways to, to put your hero in or your villain into that position um, by having them, you know, because we all know the trope of the alcoholic, you know, ex-divorced cop uh, who hangs out in the bar. And, and I know a few of them have made their offices basically in the bar. Have you ever been in a situation where someone walked in and everything went quiet? Um, not to the dramatic extreme. Um, I have been in a bar where some popular local athletes walked in, um, and it's like, oh, that's you know, so and so. Uh, you know, we're we're a college town here in Tucson. Uh, have also been in one where we've been out on a back patio and there's just a stunningly beautiful girl walked out and my my at least my table got very quiet um <laughs> it was just like wow well what's she doing at the you know on the, on the back patio of the uh of the shanty um oh but, the good old shanty uh, i love, love the shanty sh- a i love the shanty b it appears in quite a few of my writings mm-hmm. um and have plotted many a many a, a writing project there as well um, so yeah, but no, I've never had that dramatic, like the bad guy walk, you know, you can tell he's trouble. Um, but yeah, there's been a few times where, yeah, you know, oh, Hey, that guy just caught a touchdown two hours ago type of thing. All right. I gave you a challenge, create your own tavern in a fictional universe. What would it be? And what would happen there? I'll go first. Okay. And mine is, I guess it's kind of inconspicuous in which time frame or genre or location, but I want mine to be a book tavern. It's going to be called One More Page. And it's going to be a bar that has a bookstore with alcohol and book pairings and genre nights. There'll be book club meetings, author signings, fandom parties. But this barkeep would know a wealth of information about anything you need. Parallel universes, unsolved murders. So no matter what situation you're in... You can go to this barkeep and they'll know something because they're in a bookstore. So they're very knowledgeable and magical things happen in bookstores. And then combine that with alcohol. Twice the magic. Yeah, so my old stories are really set in kind of the real world. So usually uh, my bars are either real places or they're an amalgam of old bars that no longer exist. And I'll pour one out for the cat scratched in and the, the, the fumbles. Uh, recently, though, I did have to create one uh, for the bo- project I'm working on currently, where it was uh, a combination of Mexican restaurant bar and one of the uh, uh, we have event centers here in Tucson um, where people have in, pre- uh, very predominantly Hispanic. So quinceañeras and weddings and, th- and things like that. So I ha- did have to recently invent one where I could uh, have a cartel member <laughs> creating one. Uh, in the in, uh, running his meetings in the back while still making sure they could prepare for for dinner service and in, in, uh, in a Saturday night quinceanera. Ooh, interesting. The cartel has to find a place to meet. And well, it, I mean, yeah, you also have to, uh, you know, be able to funnel money and threaten people and take them out back and uh, do dastardly things. So unfortunately <laughs> for for my character, he's kind of caught caught in the middle as. Um, he basically has to do do some favors for the cartel or they're going to kill an acquaintance or, something. or so, do whatever they do. They never spell it out. But. So the meeting place is at like a convention center type area venue? Uh, you know, there it's basically, yeah, like one of those. I don't know if you've been to them, but there, there's there's several here in town. They're, they almost look like an old VFW hall, but they have like a banquet space, which is a dance floor slash bar slash. Um, but up front in this one, because it's based on, on, a, on a restaurant that closed. Um, that had a big, huge event space, but, um, yeah, so, yeah, so basically my guy has to go in and the, and the, and the, the disco ball is spinning and the, 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 the regular crew who are not cartel members are getting, preparing for a weekend event. And meanwhile, he has to sit down with, uh, Senor Cortez and his crew and find out like, you know, how to get his things back. A venue, a rent to a rent, ooh, what's the right way to say this, a rental space makes for an interesting place for devious behaviors because you could just go in and go out and disappear with the crowd of whoever was renting of that particular weekend and never go there again. But while you're there, the devious behavior, whether it's exchanging of information or crime being committed, um, the rental space is so fluid, you can hide away in that. 
Exactly. Yeah. And then this one is actually, yeah, it's owned by the guy. But, you know, there there are several rental properties that also creep up uh, in the story in case uh, yeah, things need to, to happen. Okay. So let's, I came up with a list of different types of taverns and different types of settings. And I was thinking we can come up with a signature drink for each of the locations. Now me, not now me, not an alcohol, I'm up with names and like ways in which you can consume them but you might know more than me. So let's start with first, what do you have as your signature drink for a medieval fantasy tavern? Well, I was thinking it would probably be, since it's it's a chain of restaurants throughout my medieval world, which actually never had a name, um, but uh, it'd oh, be the Green bummer. Griffin. It'd be the Green okay. Griffin, and it would be made of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, green spirit, maybe, maybe sort of like a melon liqueur, mixed with some kind of uh dragon blood and then a little bit of a, a potion on the side you know you know how you can add in like an energy shot or a protein shot at the uh smoothie stand well this one you can i can i need a little protection puzzle no i would need a protection of silence or a potion of silence you get that added into your green griffin nice green griffin okay mine is called dragon's breath something with fireball or some cinnamony uh, it would be dedicated to the dragon that lives in the nearby mountains, and people become so spiritual about dragon's breath that they drink it as almost like a way to honor the dragon or to like protect themselves from the dragon because you know they believe if they were to drink it, then the dragon would wish them good luck, or at least not kill them. <laughs> <laughs> there you All go. right, a sci a sci fi tavern. I don't know what uh, this would look like. I guess it lives in the clouds. Yes. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, it could be. Yeah, I called mine the Nebula. It's a rum okay. citrus punch that is both frozen and a gas. So I guess it's a combination of like eating a snow cone. And I realized when I said gas and vaping, uh, not that I vape, <laughs> but uh, um, I want that Nebula feel of like an inert gas. But basically, yes, it's it's sort of like a cross between uh, a Nebula and a, a, a frozen comet or, you know, one of these frozen moons. So, okay. Let's say Maybe you, you even you light it on a... fire. <laughs> okay. So, like, do you, like, crunch into it and it, like, dissolves into a gas and then you're like... <gasps> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes. <rest> it? <laughs> it start, yeah. It's basically, yeah, it's, you start out and you crunch into it. Yeah, it's like one of those uh, molten cakes or those, you know, fancy... Oh, the lava instead cakes? It, and yeah, instead it turns into, yeah, uh, basically a little mini nebula for you to consume. And maybe it's something that we can't quite describe somewhere between a gas and cotton candy that gets you drunk. But uh, cause it's sci-fi. It's not going to be earth like. No, I love that. Okay. Mine is called the rings of Saturn. Mine is called the rings of Saturn. And so it, the way it's going to be presented to you is like in a ball and you slurp from the planet, but then you like, you know, you top it off with a bite from the rings. So it's oh, like crunchy okay. and liquidy. Because like there's like Saturn doesn't have a surface, right? I mean, well, it's gaseous. Yeah. And liquidy. Exactly. And then the rings are icy bits. There you go. Yeah, it's kind of like when you drink, take a shot, and then like bite into like a lemon slice or a lime yeah. slice. Yeah. Yeah. Same idea. Okay. Okay. Western tavern. I feel like Western taverns, you pretty much have two options, and that's whiskey and, and beer. But uh, I decided to go with something I call rawhide. And it's basically okay. whiskey soaked beef jerky so that the cowboy can take it on the go. That's awesome. I didn't know what to do for this one. I put sarsaparilla, which is done. What is sarsaparilla? Do you know? It's similar to root beer, but I think it's made of, it's made of a, the, the sarsaparilla plant. But it's like a root beer. Oh. As far as I know, alcoholic? someone's going to correct me. And I know I don't believe it is alcohol. Although I'm sure <laughs> like anything, you can get an alcoholic version now. Okay, it would be an alcoholic sarsaparilla. <laughs> I guess that's it. I didn't do very well with the Western Tavern. Although, if I had to think about it some more, I would call. I would do like cactus juice or something. And the challenge is that you have to drink it from an actual choya limb, yeah. and so it's like you have to be. It's like a deadly thing to do, and you're like a true stud if you could pull it off. Yeah, I guess that's about the only way I think you're getting a cowboy. To, you know, a typical, uh, you know, uh, Louis L'Amour cowboy to drink a mixed drink. Is uh, put yeah, put it in a cactus or a, 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 a cattle skull or something. Yes. All right. And finally, a contemporary tavern. Well, in college, we invented something called the Peterson, 
It was named after Brian Peterson, who who had the heavy hand that night. It was during a, a party where we all consumed too much. And it had some kind of combination of Zima, vodka, grenadine, and Mountain Dew. The first time we had it, it was absolutely delicious. But okay. we were also very, very drunk. Um, it was the same night I think I made a drunken confession of love to somebody. Uh, <laughs> my buddy was basically almost attacked by a girl while passed out on his own floor. It was, yeah, bad night. Or a good night, depending. Uh, we tried to duplicate it, and it never never came out quite the same. It ranged from awful to mediocre. So I don't know if the first Peterson was just perfect, or we were that far in the bag. Um, personally, okay. now, I like to add OJ to stuff. Um, okay. I, like, if you get a, a, a wheat kind of beer, kind of like a Blue Moon, or a uh, a shock top which already has like some citrus in it and a lot of people put an orange i actually like to put a shot of orange juice and i also really like a shot of orange juice uh in some margaritas i think it just kind of kicks it up a little bit of a notch and does it make it healthier <laughs> just say it makes it healthier <laughs> sure you add that you add that three ounces of vitamin c and some real fruit juice i guess <laughs> yeah it fights off everything else that's in the drink perfect yeah, yeah. my drink I have a t there you go my drink, I just have a title for it and an explanation. Mine is called Existential Crisis because I feel like everyone's going through one right now. And it's got to be a really, really strong combination of something that like puts you out and like ends your misery for that day. So it's a serious drink, but then you don't have a hangover the next day. So I don't know what magic that would be, but that, that you know, I think that's fitting for people who like realize I don't... I, I'm not in the right career path that I thought I would be in. Or I, you know, just, what is my purpose in life? Just, you know, drink that. And, you know, then you're you're not depressed anymore for that day. <laughs> there you go. That's called, <laughs> I swear that's, that's enough. I think it's called alcoholism and Pedialyte. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Fair. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to squeeze this in. And I don't know how ready you are for this question, but... Do you have a book recommendation to give to the listeners that has a tavern in it? Uh, I would say, yeah, I would actually go. I mentioned them before, the Dresden Files. Um, almost every, and I think there's up to 13 or 14 books. And so the Dresden Files is follows the adventures of Harry Dresden, who is Chicago's only professional wizard. Um, he It starts out as sort of a play on the noir detective trope and becomes this huge sprawling fantasy over many dimensions and it involves everything from the white council of wizards to the black court of vampires uh to the fae uh but in within his version of chicago you have uh the the bar and it's it's uh uh mcnally's pub which again is a neutral location according to the unseelie accords so uh, no harm may befall anyone in there. And it's also, again, designed to deflect magical energies. And he goes in there sometimes to pick uh, McNally's brain, sometimes to meet up with people. Uh, it's even where clients come to hire him. So, again, um, I really like the Dresden Files and, the, and not, not the old Netflix series. It, or it was a, not very good. But, yeah, the, the, uh, the Dresden Files, can't recommend it highly enough. For those who like... Both kind of like detective fiction and, and fantasy. Okay. My recommendation would be the Darker Shades, uh, Darker Shade of Magic books. Wait, hold on. Let me just double check that is what it's called. And I'll just... <laughs> yeah. A Darker Shade of Magic novels by V.E. Schwab. This is a really fun series where a tavern plays a magical center point, a hotspot or a fixed point for parallel world jumping. So there's a series of Londons that exist. You have Red London, White London, Grey London, and our world is Grey London. And these people can jump between the parallel universes. And this particular tavern just is always in the same spot in every single parallel world. It has a different name, but usually when something appears in the same spot there's something magical or drawn to it. it's like a fixed area and so it's called the stones throw in one world five points in another the setting sun in the other and um, it's a really fun series especially for those that don't know V.E. Schwab yet it's a great way to jump in I love her voice and her stories so yeah okay so then I just have really one 
question to round to I just have one question to kind of wrap this all up switching to taverns in real life we kind of talked about this at the beginning I guess but like why do we go to taverns why are they so important to us what's their significance to us here I'm going to focus on one type of tavern specifically and that is the sports bar um, as okay. someone who has spent many a day, night, afternoon, weekend in a sports bar. Um, and I'm going to quote from myself. This is from a screenplay I wrote 20 something years ago. Um, what's not to like about a sports bar? It's a happy place where the beer is always cold, the food is always nutritionally deficient, and the TVs are always turned to ESPN. Um, and while the happy man plays theory is a factor in the appeal, there is another reason we flock to sports bars. The reason is the lack of remote controls and the envy that they create. The fact is men are genetically predisposition to wanting the remote control. Ooh. Interesting. And women hate the way we run the remote control. <laughs> <laughs> we like to flip. So when you go to a sports bar, it's all set for you? Yes. So this is why we go to a sports bar. The channel changing apparatus remains behind the bar. No one gets that left out feeling. And likewise, no one gets all the power. Everyone remains equal. It is sort of like communism through televised sporting events. The bartender gets all the power. Yes. And usually if you've gone to a sports bar in Tucson, you recognize that they have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> that was always our pitch. We were going to create a sports bar where we actually knew what sports were on TV. Oh, so, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. It used to be very hard sometimes to get something as simple as an Arizona basketball game on. Okay. Yeah, I I remember uh, going to the U of A too, how significant bars were. It's a coming, so taverns are coming of age experience, um, a place for people to come together and meet others, a place to plan and uh, scheme. We talk, you know, there's rebellious movements throughout history that, you know, a tavern uh, most likely was where they went to to plan their their moves. So, um, yeah, there you go. We have taverns. Taverns are significant in real life. They're significant in fiction. Uh, fiction inspires real life or real life inspires fiction. Who knows? But Brad, any parting words before we end this? Well, you know, you, you mentioned something. I think there, there was something we did kind of leave out. It, it's also the tavern in both fiction and real life is somewhere. We mentioned how different people could be there, but we didn't mention it. it's also a place where different people from different classes could talk. So you mentioned the conspiratorial aspect of taverns, and it's somewhere where if I'm the land baron and you know I'm suddenly cozying up to the bar next to the sword for a hire, you may not know that we're actually together. You may just think we're having a, a, a casual conversation over a pint of ale or uh, a tankard of mead. But in reality, we're, you know, maybe we're planning that overthrow or we're planning that uh, adventuring or you know, if the if the businessman goes into the bar and happens to be next to the the hitman, no one's gonna know that really I'm you know, nah, not me personally, but he <laughs> is trying to knock off his wife or his business partner. So yeah, it it can be an equalizer. Now, obviously, if the guy in the three piece suits walks into the dive bar, the guy with the you know eye patch and and well, not anymore the 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 sleeve of tattoos wouldn't matter. But yeah, so it can be the equalizer in a play that can be that kind of meeting place as well. Do you think the diner is like the tavern's close cousin as far as plot I, device and use? Yes. Yeah. Um, tavern, and I would, uh, I, I wonder if more contemporary fiction is going to have uh, the food truck or the. Uh, oh, yes. Here, I, I frequently actually use the taco stand. Uh, in, in some of my writing, again, my, my, my takes place in the in the desert southwest. So we have. Uh, Basically, the, it's the equivalent of a diner. They're little taco shops. You walk in and you get your burrito and you have deliciousness. Uh, and there's like three tables. But yeah, I think the diner and, and you know, the ones I didn't mention is the DC Universe has quite a few little taverns. And uh, there is Bibbo's Diner, which appears in Superman, which is kind of modeled after, what is it, Tom's Diner, that, that famous painting. Uh, but there's actually a bad guy bar in both The Flash and Batman where the bad guys hang out. Um, nice. And, 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 you know, and plot. And, of course, uh, there is a great episode. Uh, uh, there's a great episode of Justice League Unlimited um, where the Flash goes into the bad guy bar and basically helps one of the characters who's, who's essentially dealing with mental illness. 
So instead of arresting him, he, he helps him. And there's another famous Batman comic, and I, and I couldn't find it for this episode, where Batman goes in disguise and listens to them plotting and actually ends up turning the villains against each other, and which thwarts their, their, their plan for later that evening. So, yeah, see, I think, but the diner can work just as well. And if anyone's been watching The Sandman, several episodes. Yes, I was just going to say, so good. In, yes, in go diners. Ahead. So you have the one where. Uh, the guy with the dream ruby and i don't want to ruin it but goes in and and kind of wreaks havoc in the diner and you also have and i'm not sure if it was the same diner or not i i suspect it is uh because i haven't read the sandman in 30 years uh but the the three serial killers who are trying to plan their convention also use the diner as a place where they can meet and try to book guests for their serial killer convention oh my gosh sandman i'm obsessed and then there's the tavern where death not death uh yeah well death was at the beginning of it but where morpheus meets no, with that point, immortal yes. guy yes. every hundred years right every hundred years and you see the evolution of the tavern as it goes from uh a barely a barn where the, i think they're roasting animals pigs in the inside the bar to uh you know a contemporary bar where he's uh, actually had to open it up down the road because they were turning it into uh, condos. So, yeah, so there's that one as well. And it, it does appear in the Sandman series a few more times. Um, and if you have seen the show Lucifer, um, which was on NBC and then finished on Netflix, he actually, in the beginning at least of the series, Lucifer himself owns a jazz bar uh, in Los Angeles. And that is directly taken from the Sandman comic as well. Although, uh, is it Gwendolyn Christie plays Lucifer in the Sandman series? In the comic book, he appeared as just a very handsome man. And the yeah, the actor they have portraying him in uh, in the in the show Lucifer uh, fits that bill pretty well. I think one of the most interesting things about that tavern in Sandman, as it evolves over the ages, is that I it seems really exciting. The tavern back in the old days where you know you have a lot of scheming and lots of roughhousing and craziness that's happening and then you have you know you see revolutions and things changing out and then you get to contemporary the contemporary tavern the bar and it's just a place where people just go to eat and that's it you know like it's it's kind of quieter um maybe because it's i'm more familiar with it uh but, but I was did like, you Gosh. also notice the evolution of the conspiracy people it goes from them. You had the one, I think the one woman who was always talking in the front and the two gentlemen talking. Uh, but their conspiracies go from trying to overthrow and trying to plot the demise of the king to a much more mundane conspiracy. So, yeah, you saw the evolution. And many would say that's just because we've become more, you know, complacent in our lives. We don't have to deal with things like tyrannical kings and plagues and. Uh, you know, dysentery and things like that. They could have talked about flat Earth. <laughs> they could have talked yeah. about. And I forget invasions. one of them is is kind of going off on a tangent when I and she's I think she's on the payphone in the eighties, um, or he. I can't remember. I'd have to go right back and watch it. But I I think they're spouting some kind of strange you know nineteen eighties conspiracy. Fun. All right. Well, thank you, Brad. I that's all the questions I have. So, um, any promotions or anything that you want to say? No, if you like uh, Universe of Arizona Sports, I have a podcast uh, that I promote on Twitter. You can find me at WSR Brad. And, and yeah, as soon as, uh, you know, hopefully down the line, we have books to promote. But as of now, just plugging away like so many of us are writing every night. Speculative Sandbox is a volunteer-run podcast that relies on the collaboration of fellow creators like you. Join the conversation and participate in fun polls and questionnaires on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter. Interested in being in a future episode? Our DMs are open, or you can email speculativesandbox at gmail.com.